שמח מאוד להיות כאן, כמובן ברגע שעד uh, אמר שהוא uh, רוצה עזרה אז אני התייצבתי בדום uh, ולאור החוב שאני חייב לעד I was glad to, uh, uh, to join the team uh, at your uh, uh, immediate request um, and I owe uh, most of my career to your help uh, way back when. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, as many other people do. So, it's, uh, so thank you very much. Um, uh, and I want to thank the MIT Forum for uh, making me a, do uh, a doctor. Uh, I'm not, but I signed the uh, invitations that they made me a doctor, so thank you. It's, uh, yeah, it's always good. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the market as aspects of uh, grid-scale energy storage. We heard about technologies, but I'm going to uh, tie it all together uh, because uh, the story about grid scale energy storage is a story about uh, a dream come true for technologically inclined entrepreneurs. Why is it a dream come true? Because it's a huge opportunity, uh, as we'll see. Existing solutions are just not good enough. And they're not good enough because we need technological breakthroughs. And there are some other barriers, but those barriers are going away. So we're just left with the technological breakthroughs needed. So if you're a technologically inclined entrepreneur, this is the place to be. So just uh, looking at the market opportunity for grid scale utility uh, energy storage. So this is not batteries for gadgets. This does not include batteries for cars, and more importantly, it does not include batteries for, uh, for electric bicycles, which is much more important than electric cars, but that's a different story. Um, this is only for grid-scale energy storage, and we're talking about tens of billions of dollars. So this might sound familiar. We heard from Ed before about the PV industry growing to that size. In fact, the wind industry grew to that size first, and then the PV industry. And in fact, energy storage is the third renewable energy market that is about to grow to that size. And anyone that feels like they missed out on, you know, uh, starting whatever, first solar or uh, 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 whatever, uh, a wind turbine uh, uh, company. This is your opportunity. We're just at the beginning. You can be uh, the entrepreneur that makes this, um, you know, uh, that, that takes a big chunk of this uh, um, opportunity. Why is this such a big opportunity? Because all the drivers are pushing towards energy storage. What are the drivers? First of all, all the gadgets that we use, um, all the electrical uh, appliances, in fact, in, uh, as they become smarter, they become more susceptible to power quality issues. Uh, so we need increase in power quality. Uh, we all know now about the, the issues with greenhouse gases, so in order to deal with those concerns, we need dispatchable renewables. So we need renewables that can be used when we want them. And as the use of energy grows, then the efficiency of the energy system becomes more important. Uh, so all those lead to energy storage. A little example of those issues, so let's first take the issue of efficiency. So here's an example of California. You know, you can see this for other high growth uh, um, uh, energy markets. The peak continues to grow. The utilization load, called load factor decreases. Now, what this means is 
you know, the peak is you have to have generating capacity to supply the peak. The one hour in the one day of the year when you have the peak. All the rest of the year, some of it, and maybe a lot of it, is not even being used. How much are you using on average? Well, here you see we're down below, or getting close to 50% is not being used. And that's a huge investment that's just sitting there, not being used. And by the way, the more you add renewables, the worse it gets, as we'll see soon. Another uh, aspect we talked about is the need to increase the percentage of renewables, and Iran already said about 20% you're in, you have a big problem if you have renewables. What's the problem with renewables? Well, today's system works in such a way that the load changes all the time, and the generation keeps track of the load. With renewables, the load changes all the time, and generation changes all the time. So that's a pretty difficult situation. In fact, it's even worse than that. With renewable energy, HaKadosh Baruch Hu decides when to generate electricity. Wind, solar, that's, that's who decides. We mere mortals decide when to use it. Okay, doesn't necessarily uh, square up. It's not always true. Not always true. Okay, sometimes, you know, we can pray and maybe that'll help. But, but with, with renewables, and again, Iran mentioned this, especially with wind, you see it's, um, the situation is even worse uh, when demand peaks this is average low, renewable wind is at a minimum. Um, in fact, if you look here, this is daily. So daily you see peak and wind down, and then the red dots are where the energy peak. Obviously, something is wrong here. In fact, in California, already a few years ago, when I talked to PG&E, uh, the uh, person responsible there for renewable integration, four years ago, he said that they already have so much renewables, and this is not a lot, so much re uh, wind that at night they have to throw it away. Okay? Uh, but this is all, you know, uh, kind of hand waving way of looking at it. A more interesting way of looking at it is this this is called a low duration curve. And this is a good way of looking the, at the renewable integration problem. Why? What's a low duration curve? You take the whole year, 8,760 hours. You chop it up into hours. And you arrange those hours based on the load. This is maximum load. This is the hour with the maximum load. This is the hour with the minimum load. OK? This is for ERCOT. This is Texas. Okay, Texas has a lot of wind. Again, in, in Texas, just like in California, the wind blows at night. It doesn't blow during the day. Big problem. So you have the low duration curve. And here you have base generation capacity. Okay, why is um, electricity so cheap? It's cheap because most of the electricity is generated by huge power plants that are static. You can't even ramp them up. You can't ramp them down. This is base capacity. It runs all the time. You don't want to change anything. OK? On top of that, you have what's called peakers. Peakers enable to follow the load. They're more expensive. If all the load was provided by peakers, electricity would be much more expensive. So this is how electricity works everywhere. What happens when you add wind? So we see here the load curve without wind, and then we see the load curve with wind. We see that for the hour with the highest peak load, the wind doesn't help at all. So the amount of equipment we need sitting around to generate for that one hour doesn't change at all because we added renewables. In fact, as the peak grows, we add more renewables, 
For every gigawatt of renewables, we need to add a gigawatt of peaking generators. Okay, this is the situation today with renewable integration. This is true also of solar, because you don't know when there'll be you know, a, a cloud going over, even when the sun is shining. Okay, so for any addition of, of renewables, you need to add also traditional generation. This isn't a very good idea, even if you're not burning fuel, that's a huge capital investment. So, if we look at the base generation in Texas, and we look at the addition of the wind, we see the projection is that 42% of the time will have to do curtailment. What's curtailment? You get the electricity from the wind, you throw it away. 42% of the time over the whole year. Not only that, you did nothing to deal with this peak. So you need peak generators that provide only 25% of the load, but 90% of the time, they're never used. Okay? This is the current situation. Okay? And it just gets worse when you add more renewables. So the idea is to have storage, and storage can be used um, in all parts of the grid to improve the grid. In fact, uh, not only for renewable integration, not only for generation, but also transmission and distribution can be reduced if you add storage. Okay, otherwise, not only your generation has to be for the peak, but also all your transmission system has to work for that single peak during the year. Now, if you add storage near the loads, then your transmission can be for the average instead of for the peak. Okay, much more efficient and can also deal with issues in the network, so reduce blackouts. Okay, so the new today, the future grid, it's clear to all the, this is from AEP, but you'll see similar slides from all the major utilities around the world. The future of the grid includes storage everywhere. Great news. In fact, the applications, as we see from generation, transmission, distribution to the end user are many. Of course, for generation, you need applications for storage that are in the 10, 100 megawatt, gigawatt power. As far as um, distribution and transmission, you're talking about 100 kilowatt to you know, 10 megawatts, and then for end user use, from a kilowatt to a megawatt, right? It, with regard to different times, you need storage that deals in seconds for regulation, for instance, or UPS, minutes, hours, or days, or even weeks for renewable integration. Okay, so that's a huge world of applications that uh, you need solutions, which is good news. Lots of applications possible. And if you look at just a, a small subset of that, so for instance, for, uh, for uh, uh, the grid, um, um, for this part here, for grid reliability and um, uh, grid regulation, you see why you need the different times, because load leveling, this is night, today, so uh, storing energy at night and um, using it during peak hours in the day, so reducing the average load on your uh, generation capability. For ramping, this part uh, enlarged, minutes, so this is hours, this is minutes, and then if you zoom in on this little piece, you see that you need even sub-second regulation. Okay, so you need all those different types. Of course, each one can be provided by a different technology, as we'll see. Uh, that was a simplified view. This is more extensive, but this is also only a subset. Many different applications, again, from generation through distribution all the way to end users. Many different applications have already been identified. This is from the utilities. So the customer himself 
has said, okay, we need this, we need this, we need this for each one of these, exactly what the application is, exactly what the parameters of the storage that you need to provide. So if you're an entrepreneur, your system spec has already been written. Your customer wrote exactly what you need. And today there are many different technologies to provide solutions, uh, large scale, Lithium ion we saw before in the in the talk, large scale being you know like one block for a car. This is a whole container full of lithium ion. It's a one megawatt lithium ion block, and this is huge size. Um, flywheel storage, you know, mechanical storage, uh, short duration but very efficient. Um, uh, flow batteries, like um, like uh, uh, similar to our, uh, similar but not as good as uh, Alnum's uh, uh, hydrobromic uh, acid battery, flow battery, uh, sodium sulfur batteries, uh, different different types of technologies. This is just a small subset. There are many technologies, and many technologies are already installed. This is just installed systems. You see the very different technologies from compressed air, capacitors, so capacitors here, short duration, high power, flywheels, you know, longer but still high power, lead acid batteries used for, uh, for large scale also, lithium ion, sodium sulfur, nickel cadmium, nickel metal hydride, pumped hydro, vanadium redox, lots of technologies. The interesting thing is, although all these are already implemented, if you look at the capacity implemented, there's only one game in town. It's pumped hydro. 99% of all storage capacity, more than 99%, is pumped hydro. It dwarfs all the other technologies. Why does it dwarf all the other technologies? Because it's the only one where the cost makes any sense. So what's pumped hydro? You have extra, uh, you have extra um, uh, electricity. You pump the water back up in an existing hydro plant, right? So all you're paying is the extra. In fact, today, like the generators, can also be used as pumps. So it's relatively inexpensive. Okay, great. So there's already 124 gigawatts implemented. So problem solved. Not exactly, because that 124 gigawatts is all there is. There ain't no more where it's easy to do. Yeah, you can dig up a reservoir somewhere and then dig another reservoir and then create a hydro plant where there isn't one, but then it'll be so expensive that it's not worth to do. Okay? So, great storage. It's not as fast as we want, but still, great storage, great price, done. Okay? The other location-dependent bulk storage system is compressed air. Compressed air, you take air, when you have extra energy, you compress air into underground caverns. And then you use it with gas in a gas turbine to generate electricity. I won't go into all the details. The way it's done, it makes the turbine much more efficient. Overall efficiency is good. Overall, um, uh, over, it's not great, it's good. Uh, but again, there are growth opportunities here, uh, but it's dependent on geology. You can't put it where you want it. You can only put it where the geology is appropriate. And it's not, excuse me, it's not really pure storage. So, Cost is important, as we saw with pumped hydro, for large-scale adoption. Today, the problem is that storage is more expensive than generation. All the storage solutions, except for pipe, pumped hydro, are more expensive than generation. Okay, why would I store electricity if it's cheaper just to generate it? And I can bet you that almost any idea you have for energy storage is going to be more expensive than generation. 
very hard to break that. And we see here, uh, this is from EPRI uh, research done recently. This is from uh, 2010 on advanced technologies, all the technologies that they know of and where they stack up versus generation. They're just more expensive than generation. Okay, that's a big limiting factor. Now, some of the applications we're talking about, you can't use generation. Okay, then you need storage, but they're niche applications. For mainstream adoption, large scale, tens of billions of dollars, you need to get to grid parity. In storage, grid parity is same price as generation. Even for those applications where you can't use generation, so you look at all the different applications, this is not all of them, but this research was done for all of the applications. You look at the benefit, the financial benefit possible from all these applications, and you compare it to the cost of the storage system, Storage is more expensive than the benefit over 10 years that you can get from the application. So it's just too expensive. Okay? Almost all applications. There are some that it isn't. So again, niche applications are possible. Broad, mainstream market, tens of billions of dollars is still not possible. We need a technology breakthrough. So even with all these technologies, and look at, <laughs> look at how many there are already, you, can't, you still can't meet the application needs. You see a lot of them are very narrow. In fact, some of the idea on how to make it more valuable is you provide multiple uh, benefits. So you not only do day to night load leveling, but you also do the regulation, the sub-second regulation. Okay, so you need something that is good for seconds and something that is good for hours. You see, the technologies don't work that way. Right, flywheels, supercapacitors, don't do hours. The ones that do hours, don't do this very well. There are some that do. But this combining of benefits is uh, still very difficult today. Okay, so this is the slide. You have an idea for a storage system, CO or otherwise. See if you can, this is the, uh, if you can do this, and you know, when we started with uh, within storage, right, we went to all these utilities on that, and very, Nobody gave us this slide. We kind of put it together. But it was clear from everyone we talked to, this is like the energy storage wish list. If you can do all of this, you've got that tens of billion dollar market at the palm of your hands. Nobody can do all of this today. Nobody. Not even from Tigra. What is it? First of all, cost, grid parity. Why do I write grid parity? Because today that means it needs to be less than $1,200 per kilowatt for a six hour system or more and less than $200 per kilowatt hour DC. Just to give you an idea, lithium ion is $1,000 per kilowatt hour DC. We're talking $1,200 AC to AC, okay? So we're nowhere near that. But I write grid parity because today this is grid parity. But maybe with the escalation of fuel prices, greenhouse gas market, who knows? You know, maybe that's gonna go up. So maybe we can be lucky. But today nobody can do this. Nobody. Okay? Efficiency, over 75% AC to AC. 50%, sorry, doesn't cut it has to be 75. Imagine 50%. You lose half of what you... So lithium ion, yeah, that's good. It's over 75%. Yeah, but has other problems, right? Um, um, pumped hydro does you know, more than 75%. A lot of the traditional battery technologies do this, but then durability. 1,000, 10,000 deep cycles. Try doing, you know, 100 deep cycles with your car battery. Right? It'll die immediately, right? It's not a normal battery technology that can do 10,000 deep cycles. 15-year lifetime. 
Okay? Speed, it has to react fast. Okay? Compressed air can't react fast. Uh, location flexibility, not dependent on geology and transportable in containers from one place to another. And safety, no danger from hazardous or explosive material. Notice I was, I was politically correct here. I didn't say it doesn't have hazardous material. You just have to prove that there is no danger from them. Not easy to do. Especially with people like Ed talking about their, you know, the burn from the bromide that they got who, who, how many uh, years ago. So, bottom line is, technology breakthroughs are needed. So there's this waiting, you know, tens of billion dollar market. The only thing that's standing in the way is technology. Not quite the only thing. So there are other barriers. So he said, first of all, price barriers, performance barriers, we talked about them. There are also policy barriers. This is natural because when there's no solution, then the policies don't include that solution. So for instance, until recently, you couldn't use flywheels for frequency regulation. Why? Because that's how the policies were written. So the policies were changed. It took many years and they changed the policies. Okay, but that's just one example. There are many policies. In order to get those policies changed, you need to look at storage, recognize it as a critical element of the grid, and then, just like other renewables, as part of the renewable world, and then provide incentives and mandates. This is what happened. The PV or wind would not have happened without incentives and mandates. Okay? So you need to treat storage like other renewable solutions. That's true also in overcoming the price barriers and performance barriers because the initial low volume pricing is not gonna cut it. So you need incentives to overcome the initial low volume pricing in order to get the high volume. And then you get high volume and of course you need technology breakthroughs to get the price down even with the volume. And again, for the performance barriers, you need to support R&D in order to get the, uh, uh, the uh, technology breakthroughs. So, this is happening, and as I said, the barriers are coming down. And the likely situation in 2015 for this market is that fuel prices will be higher, greenhouse gas market, which means the traditional solutions are going to be higher. Again, the grid parity is going up. Caps on new greenhouse gas emitting generators. There are some places that already have this in place. So no matter what, there's a cap on, on traditional generators. So you can't put any new ones in. Small mark, it's just starting it's in, in a small number of places, but that's starting. Caps on use of diesel generators. That's already, that already exists in a lot of places. You just can't use them. Mandatory reductions in peak capacity. So this issue of making the grid more effective sometimes uh, is done by just saying reduce the peak capacity. And um, another way is to just provide mandates for storage. So standards and mandates, this sounds ridiculous, but just like uh, this, you know, 20% by 2020 renewables, there's already talk about like 5% storage by so and so. so makes sense. Uh, independent storage providers, so adding another layer in the supply chain, I won't talk about that. Uh, storage broadly used throughout the grid, like we showed before, and declining incentives. So by 2015, as you see, this situation is much more favorable than it is now. I, maybe 2015, I wrote plus. Things always take longer than we expect, so maybe by 2020. But, um, uh, but this is a good time to start, uh, and if this really happens, then uh, that market is right for a solution that includes a technology breakthrough. So the key to becoming a market leader is a technology breakthrough for grid parity storage. You need to start with something that's cost competitive, but show the potential for grid, grid parity. If you don't show from the, by the way, a lot of the solutions that exist today at low volume, if you talk about high volume, ultimate pricing, they cannot reach grid parity, even at infinite volume. Why? Because when you're talking large scale, you have to store 
the energy somehow. The medium in which you store it costs money. Okay? It's no, it's no, um, uh, no surprise that the cheapest forms of storage store water or air. Okay? Anything else, it becomes very expensive just because of the material you're using to store. So you need to be able to show that there's a potential to get to grid parity, which is not easy to do. Um, then you need to reduce costs with declining incentives, just like we saw in the PV industry, because, and become cost competitive in the long term with the main alternative, which has nothing to do with storage. It's just peak generation. Okay, so that's kind of the cost part of the equation to be a market leader. Of course, you need to meet the performance targets in order to have a broad field of applications. And then, as far as applications, you need to start with something. So you need to start with niche applications and, or bundled benefits because your cost is too high at the beginning. And then as you reduce your cost, you need to tailor products for each application. On the way, you need to test and qualify products with utilities because utilities are customers that take a long time to adopt anything. So you need to start early to test. So that's kind of, so now you know all you need is a technology breakthrough. There's an easy roadmap once you do for success, tens of billions of dollars. So that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>